Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Very excited to have you here for the culture of open source between institutions with some amazing panelists. Should be a good chat. Um, first off, I have the honor of sharing this session, I suppose, and facilitating it. So my name is Richard Litauer. I'm here on behalf of Moss Labs um, and Sustain and my own many, many different hats, which is very exciting. Um, and what I've been doing for the past few years really is trying to build networks of people in open source program offices, uh, largely with Moss Labs through this thing called Oswell Plus Plus, which is a network of institutions globally where people collaborate together at universities, NGOs, cities, governments, and the like. So we have some people here from open source program offices at institutions like those to talk about how the culture of open source works at those offices. This is really exciting it's for the time for OSPOs in general, um, especially because of the EC Commission's report recently, where they're calling for 20 OSPOs being made. Uh, we're seeing an explosion of OSPOs in general. So I hope that we can learn a bit more about what they are and how they function and how to make sure that they follow the spirit of open source in this call. So to introduce our experts, we're going to after this short introduction, talk about what you do and what OSPOs mean to you, basically. But for now, for each of you, could you please state your name, uh, your pronouns, if you could, where you are geolocationally, and what institution you are calling from or represent most normally. So, Kat Allman, you smiled the largest. Would you like to go first? <laughs> Sure, no problem. Hi, everyone. I'm Kat Allman. I work at Google. Um, after many years with the Open Source Programs Office, they're working on um, things like Summer of Code, Google Code In, and um, providing support for open source projects. I've now moved over into developer ecosystems where I'm looking at basically open source and science, uh, the emerging class of research developers, and frankly, how the model of scientific collaboration and the model of open source collaboration dovetail. Uh, let's see, what have I missed? Oh, San Francisco. I'm in San Francisco. San Francisco. Thank you so much. <laughs> Excellent introduction. Stephen Jacobs, who are you? Hi, I, I am the newly uh, anointed as of August director of RITs, which is the Rochester Institute of Technology, a university in Rochester and upstate New York, where I am. RIT's open programs office. We are, we're not just open source software because we have people working in open hardware and open science and so on and so forth. So we try to make sure that everyone knows it's a big tent. And um, I'm looking forward to talking about what we're doing. Love it. Thank you. Josh Simmons. Simmons, sorry. Who are you? All good. Uh, I am Josh Simmons. I uh, knew as of this year, I'm ecosystem strategy lead at Tidelift and uh, knew as of last year, uh, I am president of the Open Source Initiative. I'm pleased to be here. I'm uh, calling in from uh, beautiful Petaluma, California, Coast Miwok land. It is beautiful. Love it. Hong Fuck, you're also on the OSI. Who are you? Yes. <laughs> yeah, so I'm also associated with a few organizations. Um, first of all, is the Force Asia. So I founded Force Asia in 2009. This is an organization that fosters open source movement in, in Asia. And as you mentioned already, I'm also on the board of the Open Source Initiative. And last year, I got elected uh, to join the board of the Open Source Business Alliance, which is a, a nonprofit register in Germany, um, the network, uh, the biggest network of uh, companies in Europe that are uh, using and building open source. And one thing could be interesting for this panel, I've been working with you at Zalando on um, inner source topic, topic and help them to develop uh, the open source strategies. And before that, I also have a few months um, working together with um, Daimler Mercedes-Benz um, on uh, establishing their uh, open source strategies. Also I'm lots calling of in, Yes, Where? I'm calling in from, um, from Berlin, Germany. <laughs> Hometown, man, I wish we were all there right now. That would be so great. Um, somewhere else I wish I was, but not for the weather. Jonathan Fink, where are you? Hi, I'm in Vancouver, British Columbia. Uh, nice to see you all. I'm a professor at Portland State University and University of British Columbia. 
Uh, and I'm here in part because I run a smart city program that includes Portland, Vancouver, and Seattle, Washington. And so we're looking at kind of a regional perspective on some of these issues. And I'll also share a few thoughts from having been uh, vice president for research at two universities for about 16 years. So hopefully, oh, listeners, you can see we have a pretty diverse panel today. Um, a lot of different backgrounds coming together. So it was kind of interesting planning this because one of the things is, well, we have to make sure everyone knows what an open source program office is, but then how do you define it? And every single person you ask has a different definition for what it is and how it works and whether it's a thing at all and whether it's an open programs office, et cetera, et cetera. So we figured instead of defining it and having me talk at all, <laughs> we would ask each of you panelists, what does OSPO mean for you? What do you do at your OSPO? How do you define it? Or how have you defined it previously at OSPOs you've worked at also works well. Um, and where do you see them going? So that's a big question. Yeah, we'll, we'll cover going more later in the end. So maybe just for now, what is an OSPO to you at your institution? And I think we should actually go around and then maybe have a short discussion afterwards where we share what we've learned from each other while we've talked. So Kat went first last time. So to think Jonathan Fink, why don't you go first this time? Sure, well, I would say of the six of us, I'm the uh, least experienced with OSPOs uh, and I'm working with a number of cities, city governments, as well as universities, all of which are trying to figure out how they fit into this. Because I'm in Portland and, and connected to Seattle, we have a, a lot of large tech companies. So Intel is the largest employer in Oregon they have a lot of experience with this, as does Microsoft, as does Amazon. And we have connections with them. So in part, we're learning from them, but mostly we're learning from the network that Richard represents and that he was talking about earlier. Uh, I think that what the universities and the cities are trying to figure out is what are the benefits to offset the, the challenges of just getting this organized and telling administrators in both sets of organizations, here's something new that you should be thinking about and worrying about. Uh, when you don't have any staff who are going to make that necessarily your top priority. So we've been learning quite a bit already from, uh, particularly from Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore, um, and also from a, a few other cities that are a little bit further on the path than we are. I love how you involve cities as well, right? And Osmos doesn't just mean a large industry. It could be a, a network, it can be a connection. And I wouldn't say that you are less experienced. Um, as you said, you have 16 years of experience in research and anything at an administrative level going down, I'm talking too much. Josh, what yeah. does OSPOs mean to you? <laughs> uh, so for me, an OSPO is uh, the Open Source Programs Office is an interface for a company to the outside world, to the, to the rest of the open source ecosystem. Um, and for me, that means uh, sort of inbound and outbound relationships, you know, helping to manage relationships, open sources, really built on relationships. Um, but then not just the, the relationships and outreach piece, but compliance, security, all the other things that go with managing the use of open source. That's, uh, that's, kind, of, that's kind of how I view an open source programs office, the interface for the world. I like that. Um, what are you doing at, at Tidelift? Do you, would you say you run the OSPO there? I mean, I know it's an open source based company. No, no. So, so Tidelift, uh, I have worked in two OSPOs now. I was very uh, honored to call Kat a colleague uh, in recent years uh, at the Google OSPO and then was at Salesforce previously. But now I'm at a company that sells to OSPOs. So, uh, you know, no pressure, don't buy anything. Um, no, Tidelift is, is helping companies manage the open source supply chain and sort of helping with some of the things that OSPOs do. Are, you kind of get into the weeds and the gritty and often you end up building some custom tooling to manage this kind of stuff. Tidelift is trying to like help people not reinvent the wheel in that way and pay maintainers while at it. Excellent. Um, thank you for explaining. It's hard when you have a non-traditional OSPO or a non-traditional job, but you have a lot of experience to say what's going on. Stephen Jacobs, you definitely have a very non-traditional OSPO, mostly because it's from a university. Can you talk a bit about open to RIT? Yeah, so I, I can do that. Um, there's there's only a couple of universities so far that have been doing this or looking at doing this. And as I said, we only started in August. We're kind of all over the place because universities are all over the place. So we have to um, try to advise the upper administration on policy and compliance. We want to support our 
faculty and staff and students in doing open work and giving them the resources they need to do that. Um, we definitely want to kind of interface, as Josh said, with the outside world as well. As well. Um, universities are interesting in that um, they have three different classes of employees, which makes policy interesting. You've got uh, staff who are staff, they're employees, and generally that same kind of stuff follows. You have faculty who are employees who on the one hand are supposed to make their work public and freely distributed. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, the university and or they often would like to commercialize that as well. And where the where it's my research that's openly distributed versus it's my research that's going to get productized, where who makes those decisions and how that works can be very gray. So we're trying to work through that. Um, students in general at universities are essentially the same as employees in terms of the university owns their IP, but RIT is different than that. And our students own their own IP. So the existing IP policy overall has to make a classification that's different between students and faculty and staff. And in the open policy, I have to kind of make variations on the theme for all three. And also that we're trying to kind of clear policy around not just software, but hardware and, and open science and open data and open access journals. And a lot of universities do have policies here and there about these things, but there's no center of gravity. So if you want to find the open access policy, you have to kind of go to the, to the library often. Um, there's lots of variations between how universities do So it's a really interesting time to be trying to pull this off. Excellent. Um, Hung, you also have a huge breadth of experience with working with Osbos by building collaborative networks, right? FOSS Asia works by working with all sorts of companies in Asia to bring stuff together, as well as individual coders and individual open source advocates. Um, can you talk a bit about what you think OSPOs are? Yes, so I think um, this is an office that, um, how do I say it, that uh, coordinate different uh, open source strategies and act activities. So for instance, when I work together with the community or with nonprofit organization, we do not have an, an OSPO, but um, for, for company like Zalando or Daimler, right? So when, when you think of about an open source program office, it means that there must be some funding, there must be some business strategy that they want to, to drive in this direction. And when a company in um, in a certain side and they make it, they have a very clear direction that they want to invest in open source so that it, then there is the need of having an office or having a team that managed not only the funding but how to um, execute the strategies and coordinate with different groups within the company right at Zalando we do not have um, uh, uh, an OSPO but uh, we operate in a different way it could be a team so it's more like uh, doing the project management right so um, uh, in some companies that I see the OSPO even inside the marketing department or, or sometimes even inside the uh, HR department. So it really depends on the strategy and direction of the company where they want to place as well. So sometimes they do not call it a call, they call it a team or they call it a department. It um, really depends. But but uh, in general, it's more about coordinate um, uh, the effort from different stakeholders and execute the, the open source strategies. That I see. I agree. Um, and it is interesting where you place an OSPO that has a lot of ramifications, um, also for universities, also for cities, right? Not just for large companies, but like where you put it determines how people feel like they're free to do stuff, how they're how easy it is to procure new things. Um, Kat knows a lot about this because Google, as we know, has many sub teams and the like, and you've worked at Google's <laughs> OSPO for a long time before moving to academic work with Google. Uh, can you talk a bit about what an OSPO means for you? Well, there's me personally and there's me Google. I'll put on my Google hat here. Um, a lot of what the team does is basically help people within the company understand what they're getting themselves into, AKA license compliance. Um, Google has, I don't know, 200,000 people now and we're still a majority developer company. So there's a lot of people who are handling a lot of code. And while we have a lot of very good lawyers, the OSPO 
started in, I want to say 2004, specifically to help the company not shoot themselves in the foot in terms of respecting IP, both the literal and the, um, the objective and the subjective applications of licenses and licenses and the culture of open source. So we have lawyer cats that work in OSPO. We have a lot of people working specifically with individual open source projects. Last I checked, Google has something like 2,500 active open source projects that were started at the company. Um, or maybe it's 2,500 we started and 1,500 that are still actively being contributed to. We also contribute a lot to other uh, external projects such as Linux. Um, that means there's a lot of um, possible surfaces where we could uh, misapply licensing principles, we'll say. So there's a lot of that. Um, we also want to make sure that um, we're supporting all these projects that we rely on for our infrastructure. So along with teams working on sustainability, governance, community building for projects, there's also money on the table that we put out to support projects. Um, there's a very important difference though between sponsorships and support. A lot of companies sponsor open source. At Google, we seek to support open source. We want to provide an underlying layer of support so that uh, projects can keep the lights on rather than sponsoring specific new changes or directions for the code. And now I need to stop talking, so. Well, sort of. You also have a personal hat you mentioned. So that was your Google hat. Ah, uh, my Google hat and my personal hat. Well, my journey with open source started back in the mid 1980s with a little company called Mount Zainu, which is trademark backwards for those of us that uh, remember Mount Zainu. We were the first commercially supported version of BSD Unix long before the term open source was created. Um, one reason that I'm interested in the interface between corporate and academic open source is to my mind, open source started in academia and builds on the rich tradition of collaborative thinking. And it always kind of surprises me when people say that, you know, open source is an adventure of corporate life. Um, anyway, big fan of academia. I'm kind of puzzled that uh, the concept of an OSPO isn't normal now in academia. Um, Jonathan and Stephen, I think you can speak to that. How much trouble did you get into trying to normalize this concept? Well, I, I can't say that I actually have normalized it as yet. We're, we're having discussions primarily at University of British Columbia, um, we have had for about the last six months. Um, so part of the argument that we've made, which came from the people, several of the people on this call or in this, this uh, discussion, is that there are a whole set of functions that the university has to do, particularly when interfacing with funding agencies where the proposals have to have certain boilerplate and have to have certain processes in place and to have every individual principal investigator or faculty member have to come up with that on their own and be responsible for it is very inefficient and, and very unappealing. So to one of the ways to convey the potential value of this to administrators who are currently in those roles is to say, this is a way to centralize and offload a lot of that responsibility from the hundreds, if not thousands of people that are dealing with outside organizations like funding agencies. Um, we've also had a, a quite a bit of participation at UBC from uh, librarians who don't call themselves librarians anymore. They are archival scientists and uh, they think a lot about long-term storage of data, how data is made available to different communities. Um, so when they heard about this, they, they got quite excited. And then we have uh, people in the IT office who also see the potential benefit. The, the ultimate decision maker at, probably at both of the universities I'm working with would be the vice president for research. 
And so getting them to recognize what the value is and then to figure out who in their office is going to be responsible for that is, is part of the challenge. The, the past year has not, a, not been a good one to find administrators with extra bandwidth. Um, they're struggling to figure out just how to change their financial models. Uh, and so this is one additional thing to try to fit into that, that agenda. But, but I would say the discussions we've had so far uh, particularly as they interface with cities, there's a lot of interest and a lot of enthusiasm and, and a lot of potential champions that we could tap into. I think you're speaking a lot to my next question, which is how do you establish a culture of collaboration, collaboration internally um, at your institution? So it's easy to set up an OSPO uh, in the sense you can have someone who's hired to say, <laughs> I'm an OSPO now, use MIT license everywhere, you know, and that's about it. But it's much harder to teach people how to do open source internally, to make people interested in it internally. Um, saying things like you just mentioned, hey, you're doing the same process 500 times. Why don't we all just do that once and the OSPO will help disseminate that is a great way of getting internal collaboration. So I'm curious if you have any other tools, uh, Jonathan Fink, for internally getting people on board with collaborating in an open sourcey kind of way yeah well not to get too much in the weeds but um so as i mentioned i, I was vice president for research for uh, 10 years at arizona state and then six years at portland state and that's an interesting job where you are talking to all of the research active faculty in the university which a place like arizona state can be hundreds and hundreds of them um, and you are asking them to do more work than they might normally want to because you are, you're evaluated on the basis of the research productivity of the institution, but you're not actually doing that work yourself. So you have to learn how to be persuasive and, um, and, and you don't have that many resources to work with other than your, your personality and a little bit of overhead to distribute. So um, I think that's useful background for trying to first get people interested, the current administrators interested, and to see the value, and then also to build up uh, a network of enthusiastic proponents besides yourself. So the fact that at UBC, the, the archival scientists are quite excited and scattered people around the university, to have them go separately to the VP for research and say, hey, there's this thing happening we think your office should really get involved. That's much more powerful than, than I can do on my own. So trying to build up this kind of grassroots support and then also connecting a number of those people with the international network that you've been leading is very helpful to see, oh, this is something that's really moving along. And I guess the last point I'll make is that a place like University of British Columbia has a lot of interaction with a few, uh, a few big companies, particularly Microsoft. And, and then also some biotech companies. And so seeing that what we're proposing is something that's already well established in those partner organizations can be very helpful in terms of getting people to pay attention. I like that answer a lot. Um, it makes me curious, especially about the stopping reduplicative effort and being able to go and say, we should do it this way. Josh, at the OSI, you talk a lot about licensing and most of what we talked about with OSPO so far has been licensing. Um, how do you suggest to people who look at your license list to make sure that they internally use it to actually have a cultural collaboration instead of just saying, well, we used MIT because OSI said so? Oh, I like this question. Sorry, um, it's quite tough. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it's it's, so you're right. At, at OSI, uh, we do we do talk and think a lot about licensing. And um, just just to, to to level set for folks, o OSI is the nonprofit that stewards the open source definition and maintains the OSI approved license list that a lot of organizations, governments, and companies all around the world sort of rely on by reference. And the way I, I like to think about OSI is that it does the uh, the legal janitorial work that that makes open source predictable for the rest of the world. Um, you know, and it's that predictability, that's that stability of, of what open source means that gives us a coherent commons that within that commons, we can, we can have, uh, you know, as I say, permissionless collaboration. Um, that's all well and good, but uh, 
But it turns Maybe out like a, a better question to save you because OSI may not do that outreach week, uh, out, sure. outreach work. A better question may be knowing that and knowing what you know from your breadth of experience with OSPOs, how would you internally try to use licenses as a way of getting at people to help them actually have a culture of open source beyond the license? Maybe that's a better question. Right. Right. Because that's the, sort of that's sort of where I was going is that like we think a lot about licenses, but licenses are not the not the the silver bullet they're not the panacea they're not everything and honestly they're just the cornerstone that allows us to build uh you know collaborative environments and build uh, open governance and things like that so it's a it's, it's a precondition but it's really just the one thing and so what i what i encourage people to do is when they're thinking about license choice um think about the kind of community that you're trying to build and what you want your relationship to be with that community, right? If you are, if you are getting into business and you want to sell a product and you're thinking about using a permissive open source license because, well, that's going to help me get rapid adoption. You're probably right. It will. But if your thought is that your relationship with that community is, is to be extractive, that like everything you contribute is ours and we're going to sell that. And you know you you don't get any of that value back. Um, well, you know maybe a permissive license was 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 an okay choice from getting adoption, but you're really at that point not taking full advantage of what open source has to offer, right? There's that's not a collaborative environment. That's not a thing where there's a, a whole community of people who have a stake of ownership here and a sense that this is you know, how we're going to run the project. And I've got some say in that as, as a member of the community and a contributor. So I, I really just encourage people to think about like, what is your relationship to this, this project and this community? And what do you want that to be? And if you want it to be something that's bigger than you, then by all means, please, please pick a, a pick a license that lends itself to that, um, that opens up the possibilities of serendipity because people can adopt it and, and don't have to worry about uh, you know signing your CLA or whatever. Really, like licenses are important. They're super important, but we spend way too much time talking and thinking about them. And we should be spending more time thinking about what are we enabling with our licenses? What kind of uh, development, collaborative development methodology? And what is the governance for how we, how we manage those the shared assets? That's a really good answer. Uh, thank you. Stephen Jacobs, you Sorry. also have to have a lot of work figuring out how to pitch the culture of open source internally because OpenRT was basically set up by you. So how did you do that? So it, it was set up by me, but the exciting thing is there was a lot of interest right away. So when I first approached the vice president of research about doing this, um, you know, he said he would, I said, if I wrote you a white paper, would you pass it on to the other folks? And he didn't even let me finish the sentence. He said, if I write a white paper, he said, yes, I will pass it on to everybody else. So there was interest from him and my provost, which for non-university people is essentially like the vice president of the academic side. The, the president of the university is a fundraiser and the provost is the person who focuses on the content of the education. And we've been successful in doing a lot around open source education for undergraduates in the 12 years that I've been working in open source as a professor. And so they charged me to call a meeting when I said, I can't call a meeting. You guys have to call a meeting. Nobody, you know, there's no university wide meeting called by Professor Jacobs, right? That just doesn't work. You guys have to call the meeting. But when I sent out the RSVPs to see if people wanted to talk about this, I expected to see a couple of guys I know from CS and engineering say, yeah, we're interested. And what we got was 50 RSVPs from 37 different units across campus that said they wanted to learn more, they wanted to learn how to participate or so on and so forth. So that was really exciting. Um, so I spent the fall kind of showing up at all of the official welcome back to the college meetings to tell people what we're doing. And thanks to the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, I had some great news for them. I could say, I have a funded internal team that can help you get your project 
out in the world and start to try to build a community. Because what happens in open source too often, and especially in academic source, or academic open source, is that you know people make their thing, toss it into a publicly available repository, um, send out one email and expect like Jack's beanstalk, it will grow overnight into this beautiful thing. And that, that just really doesn't happen. So I, I have been able to tell them, look, I have a team that's essentially an internal open source digital marketing team for you. If you are working with a community that's established but wants some help rebooting itself a little bit, or if you're trying to open something on your own that's new, I have writers, full stack developers, and UI UX people who can take on a small amount of projects for the next two years to help you go beyond just that first email and repository to really let you build a community from the outside world, not just from the inside world. And that's that's really powerful. And, and I can also tell them, look, this is a you know, this team is here now. You may just be thinking of something, but Academics, when they write grant proposals or NSF proposals or whatever else, um, have to talk about the sustainability of the project. And almost all of the federal agencies and state agencies and a lot of the charitable foundations all say, your stuff must be open. And what are you going to do when our money runs out? And so I, I'm telling people who are just starting to look at this stuff, look, you, sh you should write the team that I have into your proposal. As your proof of sustainability and proof of openness, you can say we have this unit on campus we'll be working with to go ahead and make sure that we'll be able to reach who we want to reach. And that can be a powerful tool. Um, I've had one or two people buy into that concept so far. We'll see how it goes, but that team um, classes only resumed uh, January 25th. And so that team only started working January 25th. We're just working now to pick out our first cohort of projects. So stay tuned, but that's what's going on at the moment. I wish you the best with that. That's Thank awesome. Um, I'm, I heard a lot of similarities as a consultant who's helped various companies figure out how to do culture inside their company as well and how to be more open sourcey, not just in the inner source side, which is how do you work between teams, but how do you actually get people interested in contributing back to open source outside of the company? A lot of what you're saying about getting people together and saying, we already have this stuff, you already do this here, this will just magnify it, really spoke to me. Um, Hong, I was wondering if it was the same with you, with your work. Yes, so I want to talk a little bit about Zalando. I think it is a good example here. Is this is a European-based company, right? And they also one of the biggest like fashion uh, platform around. Uh, when I first started at Zalando, I want to, to say that I chose uh, to work with Zalando because um, I was very impressed by the uh, open source projects that they released uh, on GitHub. So they released about 200 different open source projects and some of, uh, of them being used by our members in the community in Asia. Yeah, and uh, uh, they, they, they publish also a lot of process how they work inside Zalando um, to the outside world. And when I, re I still remember when I first, uh, the first day when I started at, at Zalando, I got a message from a colleague inside saying that, oh, it's so welcome on board. We actually met uh, through your uh, work at Force Asia. <laughs> so, and I realized that when, when I'm being inside the company, I realized that there are a lot of individuals who are really passionate about the topic. And it got something to do with the um, uh, the beginning of Zalando in 2008, 2010, right? When they first um, established the platform, they actually um, built based on an open source um, uh, um, uh, software that called Magento. So this is the uh, PHP um, uh, e-commerce platform. So entirely open source. So from the beginning of the business, they already built up on open source. And right now, um, Magento is not being used anymore. So we use different technologies, but it is the core of Zalando of open source. So they, they understand uh, the importance of contributing back to, to the upstream project, which is the project that they depend on. Because if you want to write a direction of a certain project, you, you, you need to show that you contribute. Yeah, in order to have a say in that particular project. And uh, when I'm inside the company, I realized that the infrastructure, the tooling that they use actually make things very 
easy for the people to collaborate. For instance, uh, it's only like uh, everyone working with Git. Yeah. So we have um, uh, we use um, microservice as, as a way we develop application. Uh, every team have their um, uh, have their choice of technology what they want to, to go into. So the code uh, written inside um, uh, by any team can be accessed by anyone. And uh, there's different groups inside Zalando. There is a very active open source uh, group. So uh, if anyone in the company have special uh, passion or interest about certain technology, they can get together and the company provide very good uh, platform infrastructure where people can communicate and it's easy to organize the event. It's easy to share information from within. So basically inside uh, we have the common drive where everyone can get access from the information that you need. So they are also, uh, um, like an, an, a portal where all the information, wh whatever you, you want, is already there. It's very easy. And uh, similar to, to Kat mentioned earlier, when she uh, explained different activities that are being done by the OSPO at Google. So we also develop something called the open source onboarding. So whenever you you are you new to Zalando, I actually uh, wrote this uh, training for for the new um, uh, commerce with new colleagues. So when they get on board for the first week, they join our like tech bootcamp, and in this bootcamp a very big part of this is open source training. So in this training, so we explain the history, why we are doing open source, um, all the benefits. And we also mentioned uh, when people want to adopt something open source, what are the guidelines? And we also touch on licensing and legal topic, you know? So if you adopt something, what kind of license on the software that you should use? Everything that Zalando released right now under MIT, but people also need to understand uh, the different, um, of different licenses. And I must say the culture of collaboration actually driven by individuals. So there are a lot of people within the uh, Zalando contribute back to upstream project like um, Port Risker, which is uh, very uh, like being widely used in Zalando. And I'm really glad that not only um, it's not that the company is saying that we must contribute to open source, but individual because they come from the open source community. They already have the mindset of um, sharing and uh, collaborate. So that is a good thing. But to sum up, <laughs> what I want to say is very good infrastructure allowed um, um, employees to go and, and cry on the first day when you join the Zalando, you will see that uh, the company embrace uh, open source by providing training, uh, providing toolings for you that have you to work. Yeah. I love that answer. It's kind of like you don't need to come to church moment if you're all already at church, but then how do you make sure people stay there, which is great. Um, Kat Allman, I expect you have a similar answer for Google. You know, hey, Googlers, do you like open source and coding? Well, yes, we started that way. So I, I'm going to move on to the next question for you, which is how do you take that outwards? How do you, as an OSPO, connect to other organizations? And academically, how, how do you have Google work with universities, with academics? You're still on mute. So while you're unmuting, the culture of collaboration is what I'm trying to <laughs> emphasize here, by the way. The culture of collaboration. Um, I'm new enough in what I'm doing at Google that I'm not the best Googler to address how Google collaborates with academic institutions. We actually have an entire university relations team that are good at that. And um, so can I answer a different question? <laughs> of course, right. you're smarter than I am. Whatever you want to answer is great. Oh, please. <laughs> I actually wanted to say um, something that I've been thinking about as we are in a global pandemic. Um, I think there's an opportunity for open source to gain new contributors in this time of remote working, in this time of job loss and opportunity, um, and frankly, need for connection. It's great to see you all. I wish we were sitting at a table sharing a meal, talking in real time. Everybody out there listening to this, you can come too. We can all have beer. It'll be great. Because um, Berlin, yummy. It seems like I mean, something I cherish about open source is that sense of connection and community and collaboration. And in a time where we are denied our regular social things and no longer have to commute, many of us, um, 
there's an opportunity there for open source projects to fill that gap and give people a home and a way to contribute that in turn increases their value in the eyes of employers. Um, the missing stair there in academia is we have to figure out a way to get software recognized as a viable research output that applies to tenure or whatever tenure is going to become. Um, but people are working on that. We also need to better um, standardize citations for software again, so that software specifically open source can fit into the academic model. But I see a lot of opportunity there. Um, something I'm excited about with OSPOs in the academic and commercial setting is how they can normalize uh, the use. So I mean, hopefully someday we'll all work ourselves out of a job and open source will be the standard and um, there won't be a need for specialized education and processes because it'll just be how um, creation is done. Maybe I'm optimistic. I don't think you're optimistic. Um, or if you are, I think it's a good thing. I think that's, that sounds more realistic, actually, to me. And it actually relates to the, the question which I was going to ask finally, but maybe we could just move right on to it. Because I think we sort of answered external collaboration anyway. Um, it sounds pretty similar. You take internal stuff and you try to get people to work together. So instead, let's focus on what the future of OSPOs are. Um, where do we see them going? So Kat wants OSPOs to not exist, but that's far down the line. There's a future in, in the medium time, you know, getting citations noted for science. That's a huge part of open source, that the huge area that needs more work. And it'd be great to funnel more funding and people who are interested in license compliance for that sort of work there. That would be excellent. Uh, Jonathan Fink, you work with smart cities, not just cities. All the cities you work with are smart. Can you tell us a bit about where you think the future of Osmos goes in relation to that? Sure, I, I think it has to do with what's the future of data for cities. And clearly cities have been collecting, generating, uh, archiving data for a very long time, but not necessarily in a well-organized or, or digital way. And so all cities are now grappling with all of the issues associated with privacy and security and, and the list goes on and on, uh, particularly commercialization. So cities are realizing, well, we have all kinds of very valuable assets here that have not been part of how the city has been organized in the past. And we can look to companies to get a sense of how this might work. But it's pretty far into the, the whole purpose of municipal governance, which is to provide services to, to residents. And, and so figuring out how all of that works, I think, and having open source be part of the discussion while that's going on is, uh, is really important and is a timely opportunity. I think many of the cities that I work with all look at Toronto and the failure last year of uh, Sidewalk Labs, offshoot from, from Google, to basically create one master system for a big development on the waterfront where Google, well, where Sidewalk Lags was going to provide all kinds of services that sounded great and very futuristic in exchange for controlling the data. And when the community realized, well, wait a minute, we don't know all the fine print here, there was a lot of pushback and the whole thing got canceled. Um, so other cities are saying, hmm, okay, there's a lesson there. We need to be thinking about data from the outset and having some tools like what OSPOs are trying to provide is going to be, a, I think, a key part of that uh, discovery. Stephen Jacobs, I know you have a thought for this one. Seems relevant. Um, I, I, I do have a thought. Um, you know, in academia, we're, we're going to see OSPOs take off. You know, everybody's waking up. Everybody realizes that a lot of the things they have just need to be brought back into one place. Um, so there's, there's somebody looking at all the different projects, all the different policies, it's gathering metrics on, because we as universities want to be able to say, just like the corporations in open source say, you know, hey, you know, our people contributed this much back to the ecosystem, right? A big problem for universities is we have no idea 
you know, everybody's in their own little box and, and we have no idea what anybody else is doing. So hopefully getting everybody to, to sign on for metrics so we can actually share our story with the world like Google and, and other companies do is, is one thing I think is a big future. Um, I'm also really fascinated by the, the city issue um, and, and what smart cities can do and, and the challenge that they face. We, we work somewhat with our, um, our city's open data portal manager and, and our students. And a lot of the, the challenges that cities have in open data is who really owns their data. Um, Cause in Rochester, the school system owns the school's data and the police own their data. And a lot of the data that you would think the city would own, the county really owns and the county doesn't want to play nice with the city. So it's, it's a big challenge. And I'm looking forward to hopefully as this momentum goes forward, those people being able to kind of all come together. Um, I know that Montgomery County, Maryland often gets pointed to as a leader in open data, and that's something to really take a look at. And, and I always thought that the ownership of data, when, when Austin threw out the, the Ubers and the Lyfts for the year or whatever it was that they expelled them from the city, an independent organizer built an app for the taxis that was an open app and all the data was open. Um, and that's that's a really cool thing. Seeing more of that happen would be amazing. Um, the equivalence to on campus is, you know, how do we, what do we do with the data that we own on our employees? And, and how can we use that to make their jobs easier, better? How, we, how can we benefit our students with what we know? Those, those are the things that I really see us getting a handle on in the next 10 to 20 years and really being able to, to lift up the work that we do. Josh, where do you see Ozpose going in this vein? I think, you know, over the last 20, 23 years, has it been since we've got an official uh, definition for open source? You know, we've seen a journey f among institutions of various types, you know, academic and, and corporate and otherwise, where people, organizations have gone from uh, outright hostile <laughs> to, to open source and, and that, that approach to collaboration and intellectual property to uh, begrudging acceptance, where it's like, well, I guess we've got Linux machines running in this, this operation. What are we going to do? Um, to, to an appreciation of the fact that uh, open source means we can build more, better, faster. Um, and I think we're, we're getting up to a point where we're seeing organizations who have been on this journey for long enough to start to realize the full potential of what open source can bring, um, which is that it's not just about this, these, these free as in beer assets. It's about the serendipity and the unexpected benefits that you get out of collaborating across borders that would have typically divided us. And I think we're seeing organizations begin to understand how to work with that and begin to think a little bit bigger. And so what I see in, in the future of open source programs offices, and of course, everybody's on a different, on, on, on roughly the same journey, but at different, you know, at a different pace. So, it, you know, there's a bell curve here, but I think what we're going to see is more organizations, the standard being not just let's manage our open source to minimize our liability and our risk and, and ship faster. But like, no, this is, this is a fundamentally different way of thinking about working with each other and producing value for the world at large. Um, and so I, I think, um, I think the future of OSPOs is, is moving from the sort of table stakes of, of management, um, to, to sort of strategic thinking of like, well, no, this is this is a core rethinking of, of of what we're doing, and we should this should be um, 
weaved into basically everything else we do in our business or our organization uh, because there's just there's so much potential when we do that. Hong, at the Open Source Business Alliance at FOSS Asia, you've actually encapsulated a lot of what we talk about with collaboration because you're not just working at the one company, right? Zalando is great and they're doing awesome open source stuff and you're helping with that, but you're also helping out at a larger scale. Josh just mentioned borderless collaboration. And so I wanted to hear from you, what do you think the future of Osmos might be in the terms of how that works? Yes, so thank you for mentioning Open Source Business Alliance. So I just want to say that they are doing great work. If you are in Europe, uh, I highly recommend you to check them out. Yes, the future of Osmo, I just want to say that um, I want to second what uh, Kat said earlier. So do we really need an Osmo in the future? It should be a normal way of working. So do we need open source, uh, open source program office in order to collaborate or to do open source? Yeah, so, um, so, so I think um, I don't want uh, us to buy in into any terminology. So is it like now people have the feeling that, okay, we start now should have an OSPO, everyone should have an OSPO uh, to do open source, right? So it's about collaboration. It's about um, working uh, with the community contribution into uh, contribute into different uh, projects. So you can do it even without an OSPO. So individual can do that to do this. And for in, uh, when you talk about academia, as Jonathan mentioned earlier, so there, there is a need of having an entity in order to, to face with the outside world to, to receive funding or, or to access some um, uh, like process or procedure of course then it's always good to have a, an entity uh, to uh, to emphasize the open source effort yeah. but um, what, what, what I'm seeing is whatever uh, you do whatever the decision that, that you make uh, do open source is a core you need a, a way to, to governance to manage but it doesn't need to be possible uh, it could be uh, uh, like collaboration uh, with the community, work with people who actually know, who actually do open source. Yeah, so some companies uh, have an as well because they don't have um, a clear understanding what needs to be done. So they have uh, uh, some uh, funding and they said, okay, so say, see now we are doing it, let's do this. But but my suggestion would be uh, look into the community, connect with people who actually doing open source and work together with them. And the decision whether you need an office or you need a team, you need a, a project management or not, it's, it's up to you, it's not the same for um, for everyone. Yeah. I love that answer, thank you so much. Um, Kat, I wanted to make sure you had an opportunity. You started this conversation by bringing up the fact that right now is a great time for us to collaborate together, seeing as how we're all working from home due to global pandemic, which is not fun to mention, but it's, it's true that this is a good point. Um, do you have anything else you want to say about the future of open source program offices and working together? Looping back to the academic, um, to illustrate with a story, I last year was talking with a major research, uh, biological research center in the US that <clears throat> all their research is open source. All their researchers do that by default. And much to my surprise and theirs, their legal department didn't know that. <laughs> so I think this speaks Oops. to the, <laughs> I think this speaks to the need for um, internal uh, coordination and education about, um, as many of you have said, uh, we need to train people that it's not scary, that it's actually a good way of working and then align the incentives in academia and industry to support collaboration instead of working against it. I agree. Again, it's very easy to agree with friends who are right. So I just do a lot of that. So thank you all so much. Um, before we wrap up and move on to questions and audience, if you have any questions, please put them in the question tab or just directly in the comments. I can read that too. And I'll field them to our wonderful panelists today who've really gone out of their way to show how awesome open source can be and how awesome they are um, without doing that selfishly. They just do it naturally. It exudes. So one question I have is what do you want the audience to know? What do you feel like we didn't get covered? We don't have a ton of time, but hopefully a, a point each might work. Steven Jacobs, you always have something. What do you think? Um, universities are great places to kind of forge the open ethics since 
academics and researchers are by the hundreds of years of the scientific method kind of ingrained to share their work. And I think it's really going to kind of move forward well as people start to look forward to getting involved. Thank you so much. Josh Simmons. I think if there's one thing I want to leave, <clears throat> I want to leave the audience with it's, um, it's the sense that, 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 that you are the future of open source, right? I'm, I'm right now very um, honored to and, and, and privileged to, to occupy the seat of volunteer president of open source initiative. Um, but I only occupy this seat because I ran for the board five years ago uh, and I've ran a few times since and it's a community elected organization. Um, and open source is full of organizations like OSI foundations that are made up of people. Um, and I want you and people in the audience to think about becoming a part of these organizations. You know, have you ever considered running for the board? Have you ever considered working for a foundation? You know, these are an essential part of our, of our collective ecosystem. Um, and we're going to need our foundations all the more as we have these these uh, academic and and municipal OSPOs popping up and needing to be able to interface with sort of the corporate OSPOs, um, you know. So, you're the future of open source. Please consider working at or volunteering at a foundation. OSI is hiring a new executive director. Please apply. Um, <laughs> that's great. Thank you so much, Josh. Jonathan Fink, got any final points? Yes, I think the um, the fact that this is a an ongoing discussion that has some people who are further down the path than others is um, good to know. And um, uh, I would also say that we all have limited time to participate in new things. And the, the community that is around OSPO, at least as I've been introduced to it through, through these individuals and others, is really pleasant. And so as one is trying to choose what do you spend time with, not only is our OSPOs important, but it's something that is uh, rewarding uh, as, as an experience. And the last point is on this continuum, there are some big players who have already invested in this. Uh, just to mention uh, the city of Paris is a very uh, prominent leader. Johns Hopkins University, one of the, the largest uh, research operations in the United States is really into it. So there are guideposts that we can um, learn from along the way. Of that answer too. Hung, any final points? Yes, so final point, I think the easy uh, thing to start is uh, start to use open source uh, software. The reason why we have this conference for space stage and the reason why company like Google, uh, Zalando, Microsoft, all the people in the tech industry now uh, doing open source because they're definitely uh, a value and a benefit. So we should all do the same. So start to use open source. University, whether you uh, any sector you are in, um, uh, the first journey would be using open source. I've been working with the TU Berlin and I see that they're using Nextcloud and they also like started to uh, look into different solutions for academic sector. Uh, if you have an option uh, to, to work with open source software and uh, after that start to contribute and engage to, with the community. Why we are having this panel, I also received a message from the first uh, batch organizer asking how can we engage uh, people from Asia, participants from Asia in this conference? And that is an excellent question. First of all, the timing is not so great for, for, for Asian people. And in order to invite them into your conference, of course, you always need to reach out. You need to be in the community, you need to connect with them. So uh, people don't just come to you, you need to make an effort, get out of your uh, area, uh, actively connect with people. Therefore, I, I want to take the opportunity to invite you to join the Force Asia Summit, which happen next month, where a lot of um, open source uh, user groups and organizations from Asia will be there. And I think it's a great opportunity uh, for us to, to continue our collaboration and, uh, and stay connected. Thank you. I love that answer a lot, um, especially as we're at a German event and you're in Berlin and the rest of us are North American. Um, and it's just really nice to be able to know that borders, you know, 
just get get involved help out Pulse asia oscar open source community africa is another great community that's super awesome um cat almond i think we want to end with you any final final points uh, gee be nice to people if yeah. you've got a project people are always asking me how do i get new contributors to my project and the number one thing i could say is well two document your project three provide an on-ramp for newcomers give them a hint as to how to get started and thirdly just be nice to people times are really challenging and it's scary to connect with strangers so just be nice well i feel like that's incredibly easy here i know i said that a few minutes ago but it's still true thank you all so much for coming on and joining me for this little presentation uh, it was really great to have you all uh, we do have some questions so before we all leave and end here um i'm going to ask a question from the crowd if that is all right what are the ways that FOSS foundations or hosting organizations, i.e. nonprofits or community groups, can best explain their work and expectations to help OSBOs be more effective within their own big corp or academic organizations? It's a great question. Who would like to field this? Um, so we're just getting started, but, um, you know, it's it's been said that, um, open source works due to enlightened self-interest. That's a, that's a Denise Cooper quote, right? And so, you know, getting people to understand what, what the benefits are to them as to why they would do this, right? There's, there's intrinsic and extrinsic motivation. How do you get the people in your organization to do that? Um, as I said, we're, we're trying, see me in a year, <laughs> let you know whether people actually bought it or not, but it's, it's all about what can I do for you and what can you do for me, right? And that's not necessarily a bad thing. 